Good afternoon, everyone. I am Ann Wong with the Illinois Chapter, American Academy of Pediatrics, and I thank you for joining us for today's webinar on meningococcal disease. This webinar is sponsored by the Illinois Department of Public Health. Participant phone lines are muted throughout the webinar. This webinar is being recorded. If you have any questions for our speaker during the presentation, please enter them into the question box on your control panel for the webinar on the right-hand side of your screen, and your question will be answered at the end of the webinar. Today, we are joined by Lynn Bozoff and Dr. Paul Lee. Lynn is the president of the National Meningitis Association. Lynn's son, Evan, was a junior at Georgia Southwestern University when he lost his life to meningococcal disease in March of 1999. Lynn and her family were not aware that adolescents are at increased risk for contracting meningococcal disease and that it is potentially vaccine preventable. Lynn, along with other families impacted, started the National Meningitis Association, an organization dedicated to protecting families by educating the public, medical professionals, and others about the disease and its prevention. Today, NMA has more than 115 advocates across the nation, including survivors or families who have lost loved ones to the disease. Lynn works tirelessly alongside these advocates to prevent others from going through what they went through. Her ultimate goal is to have no person die or suffer from a potentially vaccine-preventable disease. As a regular attendee of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, Lynn has shared her personal story many times and has invited countless NMA members to share their stories with the committee. The CDC and leading infectious disease specialists have stated that these stories have made a huge difference for meningitis awareness. Please join me in welcoming Lynn Bozoff. Okay, Lynn. Thank you, Anne. I'm really delighted to be here today to share my story and hope that um, there won't be another occasion where someone like me has to share a sad story. We can go to the next slide. This is a picture of my son, Evan, and as Ann said, in uh, 1998, he was a healthy college junior, pitcher on his baseball team, pre-med at Georgia Southwestern University, and he called one day with what he thought was a migraine. You know, I told him to go to the ER. I thought, okay, they'll give him something for the nausea and the vomiting. They told us he had a little virus. We said, do we need to come down and get him? And they said, no, he'll be fine. The next morning, we get a call that your son has bacterial meningitis. He has a 5% chance of survival. Well, the next 26 days, we were in three different hospitals. My son had meningococcal meningitis. He was given a 5% chance of survival, which then they eventually lowered to 1% chance of survival. Throughout the 26 days, he lost liver function, kidney function. He had both arms and legs amputated. At one point, he suffered 12 hours of grand mal seizures, which herniated his brain stem, and he was declared brain dead. This was my healthy, beautiful 20-year-old son. And after he died, my husband and I found out that there was a vaccine available that could have saved Evan's life if we'd known about it. Well, we didn't know about it. There were no recommendations, and this wasn't acceptable. You don't want to lose a child for any reason, but to then find out you didn't need to lose your child at all was really just more than we could bear. Because of that, we decided to advocate in our state of Georgia to raise awareness of meningococcal disease. We can go on to the next slide. In 2002, I uh, we formed with four other families the National Meningitis Association. Everyone involved in NMA has suffered. The, the original five of us, three of us lost children. Two had their children survive, but 
as quad amputees. And our organization has grown a lot since that time and now includes families who lost loved ones and survivors of this disease. And as an organization, we're dedicated to edu educating parents, families, medical professionals, and others about the dangers of meningococcal disease and its prevention. Go to the next slide. NMA has two main programs that focus on sharing the stories of those affected and they give other families the information they need to make informed decisions about immunization. TEAM, which stands for Together Educating About Meningitis, consists of survivors of meningococcal disease as well as siblings and other family members. We also have a program called MOMS, which stands for Moms on Meningitis, which is a coalition of mothers whose families have been affected by meningococcal disease. There are more than 115 advocates across the country. And I know from experience our stories really resonate because no one wants to be me. No one wants to be a mom who's lost her child. You can go to the next slide. Together, the moms and team members offer a safe and supportive network for others to cope with their experiences. The opportunity to socialize with and get tips from others who have successfully navigated the maze of issues that face them is especially important for adolescent and young adult survivors. In addition, NMA conducts educational outreach to families, healthcare professionals, and other community members to build awareness of meningococcal disease and prevention. We do this through community-based activities, online networking, and national communications campaigns. When my son died, I had no one to reach out to. I didn't know anything about the disease. And many of our best advocates start as people that have called or written to us with their questions. You can go to the next slide. Several NMA moms and team members focus their efforts on supporting the implementation of meningococcal vaccination and education policies in their states. When NMA was founded in 2002, there weren't even routine recommendations for vaccination, let alone any state-based requirements. However, in the past five months alone, three states passed bills related to meningococcal disease vaccination. That brings the current total of states that require vaccination or education about meningococcal disease to 43. We can go to the next slide. I'm pleased to report that Illinois is definitely a leader in meningococcal prevention. You have a law to require meningococcal disease vaccination for 6th grade entry and a new booster shot requirement for 12th grade entry, which was implemented for the 2015-16 school year. Vaccination mandates for school entry are among the best ways to ensure adolescents receive recommended vaccines. Studies have shown that states with the highest meningococcal vaccination rates tend to have one or more vaccination mandates. In Illinois, there is also an educational requirement for all college students attending public universities in the state. Research has not shown a connection between educational requirements and high vaccination rates, so we hope to see a college mandate here soon. 79% of adolescents in Illinois have received the first dose to prevent the A, C, Y, and W serogroups. However, in order to be fully protected, adolescents and young adults in Illinois, we need to make sure they receive the booster dose at age 16. The new booster requirement will certainly help boost that number. But it's now also important to prevent serogroup B. I know all of this can be confusing for teens and parents. It's an alphabet soup of serogroups. When I talk to parents, most of them just tell me they want their children protected against meningitis. Some of our moms have told me that they thought their child was fully protected and they were shocked to learn that wasn't the case. You can go to the next slide. I want to share some stories of our advocates living in Illinois. Team member Blake Schuchart survived at age 18 and was on kidney dialysis before he received a transplant. 
Today, he works as a registered nurse who helps provide dialysis to people in their homes. Many of our survivors have dedicated their careers to medicine because they have a keen understanding of the patient's perspective. Mom Lisa's daughter Sarah survived the disease when she was 13 months old. To save her life, doctors had to amputate both of her legs above the knees, part of her right arm, her nose, upper lip, and front palate. She also now lives with permanent brain damage and requires ongoing medical care. As many as 20% of survivors live with permanent disabilities from this disease. Mom Judy Miller lost her daughter Beth to this disease when Beth was just 19. Judy is now dedicated to raising awareness to this disease and recently spoke at the Illinois Immunization and Communicable Disease Conference. Team member Katie Mayberry Hauser survived at age 18 while she was a freshman in college. She credits the medical care she received and early diagnosis with her recovery with no residual physical effects. I will share her video now so you can hear her story in her own words. And if you want to start the, the video. my kidneys, my lungs had collapsed, and I was put into a medically induced coma. I had a rash called petechiae, which was external and internal bleeding, and they thought that if I did survive this disease, that I would lose my arms and my legs. In my case, I was extremely lucky because the doctors that took care of me had been to a medical conference the night before and had been speaking about meningococcal disease. So even though I wasn't diagnosed right away, all the precautions and all the measures it took to save my life were in place. I got involved with the National Meningitis Association because I had never heard of bacterial meningitis before I had contracted it. I never want anybody or any family to be in the same situation that my family was in 15 years ago. So I am currently a team member telling my story, how I got involved with the NMA, and what the NMA's main goal of education and awareness is. Lives can be saved. Contact the National Meningitis Association. Okay, I think there may have been a little glitch between the audio and video, but hopefully her message came through, and we have several more uh, videos on our YouTube channel. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Uh, Dr. Lee will provide more in-depth information about the disease, but I wanted to just start by sharing the disease basics. And we can go to the next slide. Meningococcal disease is a rare but potentially deadly bacterial infection that is sometimes called bacterial meningitis or just meningitis. There are two forms of infection, meningitis and meningococcemia. Meningococcal bacteria are spread through the transmission of respiratory droplets, for example, coughing or kissing. Early symptoms are often mistaken for the flu, making it difficult to diagnose, and that's what happened with my son. And the disease is fast moving. Quick treatment is critical and can save a life. You can go to the next slide, please. As I mentioned before, early symptoms of meningococcal disease are often nonspecific and similar to the flu. If left untreated, the disease can progress rapidly, killing an otherwise healthy person in 48 hours or less. This makes prevention and early recognition extremely important. Symptoms may include high fever, severe headache, stiff neck, confusion, nausea, vomiting, exhaustion, and sensitivity to light. In some cases, a rash may appear. Only some of these symptoms may be present. But we tell people if any of these symptoms are present and are unusually sudden or severe, 
you need to seek immediate treatment. Quick treatment could be the difference between life or death. Next slide, please. While well, meningococcal disease can strike anyone, teens are at increased risk for the disease. In fact, about 21% of all cases in the U.S. occur among adolescents and young adults. There is also a higher death rate in this group. Because living in dorms creates lengthy periods of close contact, college freshmen are also at higher risk. Approximately 600 to 1,000 Americans get meningococcal disease each year and about 10 to 15 percent who get the infection will die. Because meningococcal disease connects so quickly, even survivors who receive treatment can be affected by long-term complications, including brain damage, hearing loss, organ failure, and limb amputations. Prevention is critical. Next slide, please. Um, the vaccination is the best protection against meningococcal disease. The routinely recommended vaccine protects against four of the five major zero groups. The CDC recommends this vaccine for all 11, 12 year olds with a booster at age 16. However, this vaccine does not protect against zero group B meningococcal disease, which is the most common cause of the disease in adolescents and caused the recent college outbreaks. In June, the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices voted on a permissive recommendation for the use of the vaccine to protect against zero group B for ages 16 to 23, with a preference for ages 16 to 18. I hope you will offer your patients this vaccine so that they are fully protected against the disease. CDC also recommends vaccination for younger children and adults with certain medical conditions, travelers, and military recruits. The CDC recently recommended the B vaccine for high-risk groups, including individuals with complement deficiencies or asplenia, lab personnel who work with meningococcal bacteria, and those who have been exposed to an outbreak. Next slide. As you can see, even though the majority of U.S. teens get vaccinated against meningitis, there is still a lot of room for improvement. Vaccination rates vary by state. One in five U.S. teens has not yet received a first dose of meningococcal vaccination, and less than one-third of first-dose recipients have received the recommended booster dose. That means there are a lot of parents out there who think their children are protected, and they're not. And almost all teens are not currently protected against CR group B. And as a note, this chart shows the national average top and bottom three states in New York. Uh, next slide. And NMA has uh, quite a bit of information and resources on its website. We can go to the next slide. For more information, you can visit our website, nmaus.org, where there are many resources available to download or order. And next slide. And I encourage you to follow NMA on social media. You can find us on Facebook or Twitter. And one more slide. And thank you, and um, I know we'll do questions afterwards, but I encourage you, if you have any questions, please either call or email me. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Lynn, for your presentation. I'm now going to introduce Dr. Paul Lee. Paul J. Lee is an attending physician in the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases, Director of the International Adoption Program and the Pediatric Travel Clinic, and Course Director for the Global Medicine Residency Elective at Winthrop University Hospital in Long Island, New York, and Clinical Assistant Professor of Pediatrics at the State University of New York at Stony Brook, New York. A native New Yorker who grew up on Long Island, 
Dr. Lee has spent a majority of his time at Winthrop since 1998 working with the unique health care issues of adopted children and their parents and seeing children who travel internationally and those with infectious diseases. He graduated from New York Medical College in 1989, followed by an internship and residency in internal medicine and pediatrics at New York Hospital Wheel Medical Center from 1989 to 1993, and a pediatric infectious diseases fellowship at Columbia University Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital from 1995 to 1998. Currently, he serves on the Prep SA Editorial Board and the Executive Committee of the AAP Council on Foster Care, Adoption, and Kinship Care. He is co-chairman of the American Academy of Pediatrics District 2, Chapter 2, Committee on Infectious Diseases. Dr. Lee has spoken widely on pediatric infectious diseases, pediatric travel medicine, and medical issues in international adoptions to local parent groups, meetings, hospitals, and physicians. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Lee. Okay, Dr. Lee, you can now begin. Yes, uh, thank you for, uh, and I apologize for the overly uh, lengthy uh, intro uh, bio. Uh, I really haven't done all those amazing things, uh, as, uh, or it seems a lot longer than uh, what I've really done with, uh, but I've uh, really enjoyed doing a lot of things for the AP, and it's really um, a pleasure to be able to speak to you today. Um, I think the most important thing to uh, take away from this webinar is, you know, really the Lynn part of the story. Well, the part that I'm going to go over is the part that I think many physicians are very familiar with, the basics of the disease, maybe some recent stats, a little more data. but. What Lynn was saying was really critical. We really need to get those adolescents immunized. And while it's nice to tell us, you know, the facts and stuff, nothing is as compelling as a story. So if you're able to relate to your patients, that relate to your patients a story that, you know, this is really what happens, and give it that human touch, often that may be that uh, little edge that you know, takes that person who's wavering, who may not feel comfortable with the, the vaccination, who is thinking maybe they'll wait till the next visit to decide to just do it then and there. And that's really what I think all of us would like. And again, I really urge you to look at what NMA has to offer and as well as, uh, uh, you know, use that information, use those stories to uh, really, uh, um, you know, convey that message of how important meningococcal vaccination is. And some reason I'm out of the, there we go all right so there's all my titles I'm just going to do my quick disclosure I have no current financial relationships although uh, within the past year I did speak for Novartis vaccines and Kyogen labs and I will not discuss off-label use and or investigation use in my presentation so Meningococcal disease, as we know, is challenging. It's a persistent global health problem. As I think what my bio had mentioned, I have a particular interest in global medicine, and meningococcal disease is, is a problem around the world. So this is a major global disease, and it's a persistent global disease. It causes both endemic and epidemic disease. So spot cases, as well as widespread disease, as Lynn so clearly illustrated, early disease can be hard to distinguish from common viral illnesses and misdiagnosed as the flu. It's very rapid, very um, has rapid onset and progression, and there's high morbidity and mortality despite effective antibiotics. In case you really need to know the microbiology, it's a gram-negative diplococcus, and there are actually 13 serogroups, but most strains are non-pathogenic, except for the big five, A, B, C, W, 135, and Y. And you can look at the table there um, yourself. You know, I'll just hit on some of the main things. A is a leading cause of epidemic meningitis worldwide, very prevalent in Africa and China where they actually do vaccinate the children for it um, in China. Uh, we rarely see it in the Americas. B is, again, a major cause of endemic disease now in Europe and the Americas. 
uh, C is a significant cause of endemic disease in Europe and North America with multiple outbreaks in schools and communities. Um, W135 is only a small percentage of cases, but have been associated with uh, 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 the um, uh, uh, Hajj pilgrims as they make their uh, uh, pilgrimage to Mecca during the uh, Hajj. Uh, one of the reasons why Saudi Arabia requires, not even requests, requires a meningococcal vaccination for the Hajj pilgrims or proof of, of that vaccination. And why is the leading cause of endemic vaccine preventable disease in the U.S. and affects all age groups, also associated with pneumonia. So if we look at the serogroup distribution of meningococcal disease in the U.S., this is slightly um, the most recent data from uh, 2012. B accounts for about 40% of meningococcal disease, although this is taken from the uh, uh, ABC, the Active Bacterial Core Surveillance Reports of the CDC, and you can see it only represents about 57 cases. This does not represent all the cases in the U.S., but is a sampling uh, from, as you can see at the bottom, um, areas in California, Colorado, Connecticut, Georgia, Maryland, Minnesota, New Mexico, New York, Oregon, and Tennessee. But B makes up, uh, as of the 2012 ABC report, about 40%. About a third is Sarah Group Y, um, and about 18% uh, uh, is C, and others, and others that were not type or make up uh, 9%. However, although this slide looks a little bit different, we do see that a lot of disease never gets uh, serotyped. So you can see the red off to the left actually represents unknown serogroups where, again, the child came in or the patient came into the emergency room looking sick, antibiotics were pushed right away, they recovered gram-negative diplococcus cocci, but they were already dead and you need living bacteria to do the serotyping. So we can see in over half of cases we really don't identify the particular serogroup, but of those, B represents a substantial portion of those um, that are type, and ACW135 and Y make up, uh, uh, again, it's almost like a, a close to a 50-50 split. Epidemiology, there's probably now a little less than a thousand cases in the U.S. each year, maybe half a million cases uh, in the world annually. It's the second most common cause of meningitis in the U.S., accounting for about a third of cases. It's the leading cause of meningitis in the 2 to 18 year olds. Interestingly, more than 90 percent of cases occur in patients less than 45 years old. Obviously, we know there are many uh, outbreaks on college campuses, uh, as we can, we've heard in the news, and there is a meningitis belt um, where there's a, a lot of uh, serogroup A epidemics in this band going across Africa, which is illustrated there. Fortunately, they have been doing more vaccinations through the World Health Organization, and the uh, uh, prevalence of these uh, serogroup A epidemics has gone down considerably since uh, 1998 when this uh, map was made. And I've always liked this slide because it really shows that serogroup distribution really varies geographically. All of us see patients who travel or who have traveled or come from other countries. And what's very interesting is that areas in close proximity can have very varied distributions of, of, uh, of their meningococcal serogroups. So, for example, while about 20% of overall cases in uh, the U.S. are uh, serogroup uh, B, uh, we can see in Canada it's actually 59%. So you just go a few hundred miles north of the border and suddenly it's a much larger percentage. You've gone up to Colombia, it's now 38%. Um, over to Brazil, again, a short uh, you know, hop away, it drops to 21%. Argentina, a little further south, 48%. If you look at Europe, uh, again, one of the reasons that uh, um, the BVAC, serogroup B vaccine was uh, so, um, you know, uh, uh, there was such interest in it was that almost three quarters of their meningococcal serogroups are serogroup B. We can see again large percentages in Japan, Taiwan, but then when you look at Africa, Middle East, uh, South Africa, Turkey, we see again much lower proportions. So again, it just you know goes on to show you that uh, um, almost like the flu, these serogroup uh, distributions can vary wildly again within a very uh, small geographic area. And the site of colonization is the human nasopharynx. Again, as the bottom of the slide says, humans are the only natural reservoir. So you don't get this of dogs or toilet seats or anything like this. It really only comes from other people. 
asymptomatic and prolonged carriage is common in the general population up to 10% of people are asymptomatic carriers, adolescents up to a third, new military recruits, college students in dorms up to possibly potentially 100%. Fortunately, less than 1% of carriers become symptomatic, and maybe somewhere between 1 in 1,000 to 1 in 5,000 colonized persons will develop invasive disease. Carriage, as I mentioned, it can be very prolonged. Uh, on average, it can be as long as 9 to 10 months. Transmission person to person by respiratory droplets or direct contact with oral secretions. Again, shared cigarettes, drinking glasses, kissing. So the droplet is susceptible to drying, so close, close contact within three feet is necessary for transmission. However, we know that most patients who have developed this terrible disease have not had contact with a case, so asymptomatic carriers are usually the source of transmission. And the reason that we do the prophylaxis for household members is that there's anywhere from a 300 to 1,000 fold increased risk for invasive disease in household context of an index case. So what are the risk factors for developing meningococcal disease? An impaired immune system, you know, which applies generally to almost all infants, but also uh, the uh, uh, people who have specific uh, um, you know, immunodeficient uh, conditions. Nasopharyngeal irritation, disruption of mucous membranes. Again, if it's colonizing the nasopharynx, this is what allows the bacteria to become invasive and get into the bloodstream. And then there are social factors involving close respiratory contact. So coughing, sneezing, kissing, as mentioned before, sharing of drinks, food utensils, smoking, again, because of the uh, nasopharyngeal irritation, number and closeness of social contacts, and crowded conditions. Fortunately, the incidence by disease has been falling over the past uh, uh, 35 years or so, 30, 35 years. And we can see, although there are little upticks here and there, we can see between 1991 and 1996, there was an increase kind of going downwards. And then you can see even around 2008, there was a slight tick upwards before the uh, overall general trend downwards. If we look at the incidence by age, we see that overall the biggest number of cases or the, uh, the highest incidence is in exactly who would we, we would expect. Uh, we generally expect disease to be most severe in the age extremes. They're very young and they're very old and we can see again those less than one tend to have the highest incidence rate. And we can see that Sarah Groupie makes up a substantial uh, percentage of that uh, of identified of, all, of, of uh, the disease overall. But the pink represents, again, unknown serogroups. But if you just look at the uh, blue compared to the uh, uh, green, blue represents the vaccine, currently uh, vaccine preventable strains of the quadrivalent vaccine. And you can see serogroup B, again, is a substantial number. It still remains a substantial number in the one to four year olds, um, a decent number in the five to 14 year olds, and again, a substantial number in the five, 15 to 24 year olds. What is also interesting that I take away from this slide is if you look at the overall incidence, while it does go down, it does start to come back upwards in the 15 to 24 year olds, it's lower again, but then also increases as we would expect in those greater than 65. And it's just interesting that again, people that we would normally consider to be at high risk, those greater than 65 seem to have an incidence rate just about somewhere in the same ballpark as those 15 to 24 years of old and those one to four years old. And what this slide shows is an actual breakdown of the number of cases from the uh, um, CDC's MMWR. So this represents all reported cases in the US from 2012. And again, we can see B in the red at top makes up a substantial number of those cases. The currently vaccine preventable, uh, uh, quadrivalent uh, vaccine preventable cases in the pink uh, uh, make up a much smaller percentage in the children and then it starts to turn the other way as the uh, patients get older um, and still a lot of uh, untyped disease. So as Lynn had mentioned and again um, I'll go through this quickly because uh, I think uh, Lynn's uh, description of what happened to her um, Evan really kind of says it all but you can see here that uh, um, 
within the first 48 hours there's irritability, loss of appetite, fever, nausea, sore throat, runny nose, nothing specific. Again, we see patients like this all, uh, all year round. Within the next um, uh, you know, uh, seven to eight hours we see the petechiae start to form, purpuric rash, the neck stiffness, the photophobia as the bacteria starts to reproduce rapidly within the body. And then finally, okay, I apologize, it's not moving onwards, but within the last, there we go. Um, okay, sorry, there's a little lag there, so I'll go back. Within the last um, um, eight hours, there's an illustration of the particular and purpuric rash. And then finally, within 16 to 24 hours, so again, this all happens within a day, confusion and seizures, uh, they lose consciousness, they develop sepsis, shock, multi-system failure, and death. Median time from hospital admission to, from, uh, uh, from the disease onset is only about 19 hours. And that's really frightening for, uh, when you consider that you could be totally healthy and by this time tomorrow you could be either uh, um, on your way out or in an intensive care unit in critical condition from this disease. And it's really that fast. And unfortunately, intervention often does not occur until patients have these late stage symptoms. Um, it's uh, um, very unfortunate that uh, um, by the time you get to this late, these late stage symptoms, again, um, it really may be too late. There are other clinical symptoms about you know, half of patients develop sepsis, close to half develop meningitis, a smattering of other things, but up to 60% of infections will get actually the worst of both worlds. They will both, they'll develop both sepsis and meningitis. Mortality rates are highest with sepsis, over half of the patients will die from this. With meningitis, with sepsis, about a quarter of patients will die. How about your overall prognosis? Um, I remember looking at an article from the Archives of Internal Medicine written by one of the uh, Army uh, um, surgeons, W.W. Uh, w. Herrick, in 1919. And he ended this uh, case report and a review with the, this quote, no other infection so quickly slays. Nothing kills you faster. And I found it interesting that this was written almost 100 years ago, before there were antibiotics, before there were intensive care units, before we had intensivists, suppressors, and all the wonderful modern uh, medical technology we have. The amazing thing, though, is that if you present to the ER at hour 1920 with a purpura sliding into sepsis, your odds of surviving are about the same as they were in 1919, which is not very good because the uh, disease is just so fulminant. And case fatality rates still remain high despite um, available antibiotics. And again, we all should know that antibiotic of choice for this infection is plain old penicillin G. So case fatality rates in the general population range from 10 to 14 percent, although, again, very interestingly, I often, uh, you know, ask, patient, you know, uh, you know uh, residents or medical students, who do you think is more likely to succumb from this, a six-month-old or an 18-year-old uh, football player? Interestingly, the case fatality rates seem to be higher among the adolescents and young adults. It really approaches that 25 percent mark, which, again, is substantially higher because among infants, the same case fatality rate is closer to 6 percent. Nearly half of the patients hospitalized within the first 24 hours of their illness will subsequently die, many within a few hours. Um, and again, if you look at the NMA site, read through some of their stories, um, you will see, and if any of you have taken care of a patient, you are probably very well acquainted with how terrible and how quickly this disease can take you. Among the survivors, uh, it's interestingly, the CDC statistics say it's 11 to 19 percent suffer significant sequelae, limb amputations, hearing loss, brain damage, seizures, other serious sequelae. Over the 15 plus years that I've been doing pediatric infectious disease, I've seen eight patients and pretty much all of them have suffered significant sequelae. So, uh, and virtually all of them have suffered, actually all of them minus the one who actually passed, um, actually had amputations.
So serious outcomes, if you have meningococcemia, which is again just a fulminant bloodstream disease, you can see listed there the uh, serious after effects, skin sores, limb loss from the gangrene that occurs as the uh, septic emboli plug up the, those blood vessels, kidney failure for the same reason, the septic arthritis, pneumonia, pericarditis, 40% fatality rate, the meningitis alone, again, if you only have meningitis, you know, it's sad that at the bottom it's a 3 to 10% fatality rate, you know, again, a happier numbers compared to what can happen with meningococcemia or meningococcemia with meningitis. But still, you're left could be left with hearing loss, quadriplegia, hemiparesis, strokes, cerebral edema, cranial nerve palsies, and in uh, some of the patients I've seen, permanent intellectual disability. So the rationale for immunization is, again, persistent global health problem. I showed you the map earlier. This is a disease that exists all around the globe. So even trying to take care of it just here in the U.S., it's still going to be you know, potentially brought into the U.S. by those people who are otherwise look ha ha uh, healthy and are uh, asymptomatic carriers. Though again, second important rationale for immunization, 98% of cases are sporadic and isolated. One case here, one case there. They really don't have those large outbreaks. We're probably much better at handling epidemics and dealing with a mass outbreak, but when you have just one patient in the community that has it or one of, uh, patient in the town, it becomes much harder to figure out how you're going to you know, protect uh, uh, everybody. Again, you could probably throw out uh, antibiotics and prophylax lots of people, but again, as we know, the anticipatory guidance, the way of, best way of prevention is to try to make sure that they don't contract the disease in the first place through immunization. Third rationale for immunization, early disease is hard to distinguish from common viral illnesses, as both Lynn and I have said, and it's often frequently misdiagnosed as a simple viral illness. And again, I think any of us would say the same if we just saw a patient who was a little achy, having some fever, a coryza, and again, these very nonspecific mild symptoms. But again, as we know, it is rapid, has rapid onset progression, and high morbidity and mortality, especially among 15 to 24 year olds. Again, uh, the group that we would normally think would be the healthiest, the ones that need the less you know, uh, care, um, and uh, the, the ones that we assume would do the, you know, the best uh, out, of, uh, out of anybody who gets sick. Uh, we just have these high morbidity and mortality rates in these 15 to 20 years, higher than other age groups, despite effective antibiotics and hospitals, hospital supportive care. So these are the approved meningococcal vaccines for the uh, four um, uh, um, serogroups, A, C, W, Y, which you should be very familiar with. Um, as of 2015, um, there was the original polysaccharide vaccine, Menimmune. Again, these uh, um, what distinguishes the A, C, W, and Y are polysaccharide antigens. That's how we classify them. So it's perfect, it makes perfect sense that you would have um, a polysaccharide vaccine. So it's, a, it's actually uh, these specific antigens and your body will identify these antigens and make antibodies against them. So it's a quadrivalent vaccine. It contains a polysaccharide uh, antigen A, C, Y, and the W135. It's approved for two and older and approved in 1981 by the FDA. The problem though is that polysaccharide vaccines are not terribly immunogenic. Um, and as a result, we know that other polysaccharide vaccines, like the original pneumococcal vaccine, Pneumovax, had the same problem, not really protective in those two and older, yet we saw lots and lots of pneumococcal disease in younger patients. So smart people said, huh, how can we basically make this polysaccharide more immunogenic? And what uh, does stimulate the immune system? Proteins. So why don't we take a carrier protein conjugate it or bind it to this um, a polysaccharide, and we have a conjugate vaccine. So the first of these meningococcal conjugate vaccines was Menactra, um, for, uh, which came out in, originally came out in 2005, which used a diphtheria toxoid carrier protein. And then jumping to the bottom, Menvio, which used a different carrier protein, CRIM197, which is the same carrier protein in Prevnar, conjugated to the four polysaccharide groups. Uh, Menvio came out uh, five years after Menactra, and then, as you can see, uh, under both Menactra and Menvio, they uh, both got an uh, indication down to two years of age, and then 
Um, one minor difference between these two vaccines, Menactra is FDA approved down to nine months of age through 55 years of age. Menvio is approved down to two months of age up to 55 years of age. And finally, the uh, last approved meningococcal vaccine for men ACWY is the Menhibrix, which is a meningococcal C and Y because, as I had uh, shown you earlier, C and Y represent the bulk of uh, disease in the U.S. with A really not being seen here in the last 50 plus years and W135 again rarely being uh, seen um, and combining it with the Hib vaccine and creating a Hib men CY vaccine only, uh, again, using a tetanus toxoid and indicated from six weeks to 18 months of age as part of that primary Hib uh, vaccination series, and that was approved in 2012. I won't spend much more time on this because I think most of you, again, and Lynn had touched on this as well, are very familiar with the 2015 meningoco meningococcal conjugate vaccine recommendations. Again, it is you know, uh, universally recommended for persons age 11 to 18, two doses, you know, first preferably at 11 to 12, with a booster at 16 to 18. No booster is required if the primary dose was done after 16. Uh, if you're HIV infected, two doses, two months apart. Uh, as Lynn had touched on, persons age 2 through 55 years with persistent complement uh, um, uh, co component deficiencies, um, or functional uh, anatomical asplenia, two doses, two months apart, and at the earliest opportunity, if a one-dose uh, primary series is administered, then you can give it every five years. And then finally, persons age two through 55, that's weird. Not sure why that happened, so my apologies. There we go. 2 through 55 with prolonged increased risk for exposure. And recommendation is for one dose, persons age 2 through 6, after, uh, there would be a booster every three years, seven and older, just like the uh, patients who are asplenic or have complement deficiencies every five years. Other risk groups are microbiologists routinely working with Neisseria meningitides, which hopefully aren't any of your pediatric patients. And as Lynn had also mentioned, travelers to a residence of countries where meningococcal disease is hyperendemic or epidemic. And finally, I'm just going to talk about the MenB vaccines. We know that there are two that have been approved in the U.S. Um, now in 2015. Uh, there's a uh, um, Vexero, which is uh, also called, if you want to use the uh, non-trade name, MenB4C, and I'll get, I'll explain why in a second. And Chumenba, which is a MenB FHBP vaccine. Uh, Vexero is called 4C because it actually contains four components, FHBP, a factor H binding protein, an NHBA, a heparin binding antigen, a NAD-A, a NICEL adhesin, antib um, um, a, adhesin A uh, antigen, and uh, Trumemba contains two variants of the factor H binding protein. You can see here, Vexero is two doses, approved 10 through 25 years of age, by the FDA, Trumenba, same thing, although it's three doses. So this is just a quick thing, and I know it's a little a bit busy, but the problem with the MenB vaccine is that, again, as polysaccharide vaccines, uh, the problem with MenB and why B was so, so difficult to come up with a vaccine for is that the polysaccharide uh, coat of, uh, of um, men meningococcal B has a lot of sialic acid residues. Well, our neural tissue in our body contains a lot of sialic acid residues. So basically, MenB looked a lot like nerve tissue, and your body's not going to want to create antibodies against your nerves. So as a result, the MenB vaccines tend to not to be very immunogenic. So the approach that was taken was to look at what are called these subcapsular proteins. This FHBP, the factor uh, um, heparin binding protein, these different poor A's, this NAD A subcapsular protein, and then use that as the basis for the vaccine. So for, um, if we look, actually I'll go back for a second, to uh, Vexero, Vexero includes one of these, it includes one of these, it includes one of these, and then if I just go back for one second, this last, this, this NZ-POR-A is actually um, a 
cytoplasmic vesicle antigen um, that's uh, often found in these uh, outbreaks as well. So you won't actually see it in this next picture, but there are a total of four components. Trumemba uses that same factor H heparin binding protein seen here. It turns out there are actually two subfamilies, A and B. So, um, so Trumemba's approach was to just basically say since FHBP is expressed in more than 97% of serogroup B meningococcal disease strains, um, they would target this particular and use both subfamilies. Vexero uses the factor in heparin binding protein, uh, uh, factor H uh, heparin binding protein, but only uses the subfamily A. Oops, and I'm sorry, I guess I forgot I had this slide here, but again, this shows you the uh, four components, and then this is the uh, FHBP variant one, it should be actually say, uh, type A, the NAD A, the NICERIAL M binding antigen, and this poor A, which is presented as part uh, of uh, outer membrane vesicle. And as you can see, the outer membrane vesicle was taken from a New Zealand outbreak strain. So the summary of recommendations for the MenB, currently anybody greater than 20, uh, again, this is from the, uh, I should have uh, labeled this more clearly as ACIP, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices of the CDC. So ACIP actually said that anybody 10 years of age or older at increased risk uh, with persistent complement component deficiency, which are listed below if you really want to see here all these specific things, if you're taking this particular medicine for paroxysmal nocturnal uh, um, hemoglobin uh, urea, uh, functional or anatomic asplenia, the microbiologist again, and those at increased risk because of a serogroup uh, B outbreak. And this was the recommendation that had come out of the February ACIP meeting. Recommendation again with a primary series, either the two doses of Bexar, which have to be at least one month apart, or three doses of Trumemba, which are given very similar to like um, the uh, um, HPV vaccine, three doses at zero, two, and six months. The June meeting, as Lynn had mentioned, um, the recommendation that came out was that it may be administered, so a permissive indication to adolescents, young adults, 16 to 23 years, to provide short-term protection against most strains of serogroup B disease, preferred age, as Lynn had mentioned, 6 through 18 years of age. This was given, though, a Category B recommendation, um, and that's important because Category means that B means that it is up to the provider to make that decision. And the reason that ACIP specifically made it as a category B, category A is the usual mean uh, recommendation, which means it's universal, applies to everybody. Category B, however, still means that it's a clinical call and really makes it more uh, likely that insurance companies will cover it because they're basically saying that it's not like um, you know, a totally permissive uh, recommendation. If your clinical judgment is that uh, uh, this patient requires uh, or, you know, needs this vaccine, then um, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's really justified at that point. And as a result, many of the insurance company carriers will likely be covering uh, the vaccine uh, or for the patients who request it. But again, it was still not fall short of that universal recommendation. The other difference that ACIP had uh, uh, taken was that although FDA has only approved both vaccines for 10 through 25, ACIP has, decided, has actually specifically said anybody 10 years of age or older at increased risk may receive the MenB vaccine. So again, slight difference between what FDA says and what the ACIP has said. So I'll Oh, and since people often worry about side effects, uh, most common solicited side effects for the men before C, the Abexar in the seven days after C were pain at the injection site, myalgia, redness, fatigue, headache, induration, nausea, and arthralgias. Most common solicited adverse reactions occurred seven days after receipt of MenB FHBP, the Tremenba, in clinical trial of pain at the injection site, fatigue, headache, myalgia, and chills. So I'll conclude with another point that uh, Lynn had brought up, which is that we're doing pretty well. We, you know, are uh, at about almost 80 percent, which was the Healthy People 2020 target for at least receiving at least one dose of men ACWI. But if you want to be the pessimist, looking at the other side of the glass, while we're approaching that four out of five have received it, as Lynn so clearly, uh, you know, explained one out of five still have not even received that one dose. So 
given the devastation of this disease, we really need to make sure that we're get, reaching out to that last one in five. Um, again, we've come close to the healthy people 20, originally um, uh, healthy people 2010 target of 90% for Tdap, and obviously for HBV, we're still quite lagging. This is the female data, and as we know, for at least one dose for the males, it's probably about half that in the uh, 30s. So U.S. has still not achieved its goals for adolescent vaccination, except for Tdap, despite both AAP and ACIP recommendations. So I'll just leave you, you know, charge you with the uh, fact that um, we are doing very, very well thanks to all our efforts, but again, given how terrible this disease is and what it can do to our patients, we really want to continue to push onwards and eke out that la those last few inches and try to make sure that we really receive, make that 100% mark. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, so, Dr. Lee. Let turn this back over. Oh, yes. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lee, for that presentation. Um, we are now going to take some questions from people. And just a reminder, it's going to be on the right-hand side of your screen. There's like a little questions toolbar that you guys can answer your questions into. So um, Dr. Lee and Lynn, I'm going to read the question out loud to you guys, and then um, you guys can answer the question, whoever thinks that they can answer it best. So first question that I have. I'm going to have to unmute Lynn, and I, uh, I, I don't see the, uh, the control to uh, hand over control back to you. So let me, uh, oops. Oh, I already, I already have the control back, so. OK. Right, good. I was going to say, it looks like, uh, OK, good. OK. So um, the first question is, if type B accounts for so many cases of type B, why did the CDC not recommend it for routine use? And will manufacturers combine the vaccines into one meningitis vaccine? Um, I guess uh, I'll start off, and Lynn can uh, jump in as well. Um, the reason, unfortunately, I think, as we're starting to see with many things in medicine, is and en ends up being dollars and cents. Yes, it is a lot of disease percentage-wise, but as I think uh, one of my uh, slides showed, the percentage of case, number of cases is going down. If there's less than a thousand cases in the U.S. Um, each year, and we're talking about vaccinating millions of people, you know, somebody's going to have to pay the bill for all these vaccines, particularly a two-dose series. So, unfortunately, somewhere along the line, you know. These pragmatists come in and say, well, wait a minute, how many lives are we saving? Um, and then they do that horrible term that I, I think all of us in medicine cringe at, cost-benefit analysis, and then decide, you know what, is it really cost-beneficial to spend billions to maybe save, you know, a few dozen people or, you know, a few hundred people? Um, it's a terrible way to look at things, uh, one that I don't particularly agree with, and I think many people would strongly disagree with, but in this era where everybody's screaming about healthcare costs, unfortunately, ACIP and other government groups really have to start to take a look at this. So um, eventually, hopefully, maybe as costs of the vaccine come down and as if the disease continues to be as terrible and as if there's enough ongoing public pressure, hopefully this will become a, a standing vaccine particularly if, as I think the questioner had said, if it is combined into, uh, so you have a pentavalent vaccine with A, B, C, W135 and Y, unfortunately that would also require further studies to show that and a whole new set of clinical trials to show that it's immunogenic because if you add something to it, you have to start all over again. It's not just, you can't assume putting everything into one means that it's just the, the same as giving two separate shots. And also at the age ACIP meeting, they did say that they would readdress the recommendation as more uh, post-licensure data became available. Yes, I mean safety is always a concern, and I think the one holdout uh, on the on the vote uh, in June was because of concerns about safety. And yeah, because these vaccines have only been out for months, there's really no long-term data. But presumably, uh, uh, as we gain that data and people get more confident, comfortable with this vaccine. Uh, we'll see better acceptance as well. Okay, thank you. So um, the next question I have is, do we need to recall our kids who have received Minactra as required for 6th grade and 12th grade for a MenB vaccine? If you're talking as 
to me, as a parent who's lost a child, I would say, yes, you want to get your 16-year-old vaccinated with the B-Sero group. Because even though the disease is rare, someone is going to get the disease, and you don't want it to be someone that you care about. And the way I would phrase it is you don't need to recall them, but you don't need to wear your safety belt, and you don't need to buy car insurance. You know, they're... Um, it's not a requirement. Again, this is not again. Or, or, as you know, again, it's a category B recommendation, so it's not a universal recommendation. It's really your clinical call. If you feel this is something that would benefit your patients, and again, as long as again, hopefully, um, you will verify with the different insurances that they are going to cover it. Which um, I think there's very strong belief that they will. Certainly through uh, um, the uh, um, oh great uh, uh, vaccines for children program um, and. Uh, the, the, the uh, MenB vaccines will be covered. And if that happens, many insurance companies will, especially given this Category B recommendation. So it's something that if uh, you offer it to your patients and they are interested, it should be covered. But uh, um, I would certainly treat it in many ways probably uh, like a flu vaccine, uh, or actually like flu vaccine in the sense that it should be offered to everybody. And if they do it, again, hopefully make sure that it will be covered. But I shouldn't have used that comparison because, again, flu vaccine is a universal recommendation. Okay, so our last question is, and you know, once again, I just might want it to remind people that if you do have any questions, feel free to enter them now. So um, we recently started administering Trumenba. Our main concern is if a patient is receiving the series at 16 years old, will they have the sufficient protection before entering college? Um, great question. Um, Again, if, and I guess the problem is that because the vaccines have not been out that long, um, in the original um, trials, and I guess this is just uh, information if uh, anybody wants to dig deep, deep enough, they can, um, you know, find uh, from different, uh, um, you know, um, scientific meetings where data was presented. Um, there is data going out about a year or so where the titers seem to be holding up well. Um, certainly, at least with, it, with I know the experience with, uh, um, an actor was that the titer seemed to fall out after five years. So again, the thought is if we're, uh, and I think ACIP is thinking uh, along a similar line, that if we give it at 16 to 18, it should cover them through their college years, assuming that uh, they don't decide that they want to travel to Europe and take lots of time off and do that seven-year uh, college experience instead of four. Okay, oh, and we have another question. Right now, um, Lynn, did you have anything to add to that, or should I go to the next question? No, you can go to the next question. Okay, so our question is, can you give Minactra and Trumemba on the same day, or do they need to be separated? Um, ACIP has said that they can be given on the same day. Okay, so, oh, and another one just came in. And actually, I should just add, ACIP has also said that uh, from their perspective, um, any of these vaccines can maybe co-administered uh, with other routine uh, um, adolescent vaccines. And that was looked at in the uh, clinical trials for both uh, the Tremenda and the Bexero. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lee. So another question is, has this disease anything to do with high temperature zones, especially in Africa? Um, to my knowledge, not really, because uh, again, um, it, it probably, no, I would say uh, n uh, not. It's an interesting question that I've never heard before. Um, certainly there are some viruses like RSV where we do tend to see it closer to the equator, and then we see, or chickenpox where we rarely see it close to the equator, much more in more temperate zones. But uh, the main reason I would say no is uh, that we, the, the peak of meningococcal disease and where we tend to see highest rates are during winter months here in uh, the U.S. So um, I don't think it has anything to do with the heat itself. This is just a global disease. It's just in your nasopharynx, and it would be um, similar to wondering if uh, ear infection rates are higher close to the equator than uh, at the North Pole. It's probably all about the same. Oh, and... Um they added because it is endemic in northern parts of Africa. Yes. Um, at, well, actually more along that mid part of sub-Saharan Africa. Yes. The MEN-A seems to be very um, 
uh, persistent there, although they have knocked it down by about 80, 90 percent over the past uh, uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, but however, men A was prevalent in the U.S. Um, until about the 1950s, and then it just sort of vanished. And for reasons that are, are still unclear, we just stopped seeing men A here in the U.S. And uh, um, if we go with global warming uh, theories, then theoretically we'd be seeing a lot more men A now. Okay, thank you for that, Dr. Lee. So it doesn't look like we have any more questions right now. So if you guys, Dr. Lee, um, Lynn, do you guys have anything else to add? No, but it's, again, thank you for inviting both of us to speak today. Yeah, that, definitely. Thank you so much for speaking. It was very, very informative. Um, and yes, and I was, as I always hate, you know, it's like to say, uh, you guys are doing a tremendous job out there vaccinating your kids. I know we're all giving 100%, but try to give that 110% and, uh, again, get those immunization rates uh, uh, higher. Okay, thank you so much, guys. So I just wanted to end this webinar by once again thanking Dr. Lee and Lynn for their presentations. And all the participants will receive an email by the end of business day today, and it will have a link for future webinars and also a link to, power, to PDFs of today's PowerPoints and also the recorded video for today's webinar. Thank you everyone so much for participating in this webinar once again, and hopefully we'll see you guys for our future webinars coming up later at the end of the year. And thank you again, Dr. Lee and Lynn.